Hello, good afternoon, welcome. Hello, good afternoon, welcome. Hey, thank you, all right. Uh, I'm Josh Ellis from the Metropolitan Planning Council. I wanna welcome you all, thank you all for coming. Uh, to today, this is our first roundtable event of uh, 2015. Uh, for those of you who uh, know us and have come to our events before, uh, the only difference between this and past events is that we have fewer speakers, which means they're gonna speak for a longer period of time, uh, which is great, so we can get more into depth on, on their perspectives on the issue. Um, in addition to thanking all of you and thanking David Wagoner and Kobe Ruthenberg for joining us today, I want to make sure to thank AECOM, who's our sponsor of today's event. Uh, we have an AECOM team sitting up here in the front. Uh, and uh, as, I, as I explain uh, the, the context for this event, uh, we've got a lot of our government partners and nonprofit partners here in the room too, uh, and I will thank all of them uh, in due time. So um, a little bit of background on today's uh, issue and some stuff that's going on here in the region, which is pretty exciting. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the reality is uh, Katrina, Superstorm Sandy, uh, some other events have, uh, have awoken interest in Washington, D.C. in particular uh, to issues of resilience. And we're not really going to define resilience here today. I think everyone around the room would define it a little bit differently. Um, the simplest terms is how much of a licking can you take and keep on ticking, right? Um, we're not going to get into it too, too much. It means different things to different people, and some of that will come out in, in David and Kobe's presentations. Um, but the reality is those major storm events, the social and ecological vulnerabilities that those storms uh, revealed uh, in those communities, uh, and a lot of work since then has led, that's all a very long story short, uh, to a competition, a national competition uh, that the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and really that urban development part of HUD, uh, is leading called the National Disaster Resilience Competition, NDRC, not to be confused with our pals at the Natural Resources Defense Council who are in RDC who are helping on the NDRC application, which makes it all very confusing. All right, uh, so the National Disaster Resilience Competition is a $1 billion uh, national competition. There are 60 plus eligible entities throughout the country, most of whom are state governments, uh, but there are in some places some uh, local units of government. And here in the Chicago region, we're very unique in that we have multiple local units of government neighboring uh, DuPage County, Cook County, and the city of Chicago, who are all independently eligible, as well as the state of Illinois, largely stemming from flooding in 2013 uh, for the state. There's also some tornado issues from a little further past uh, that have made them eligible for this. And we're one of the only places in the country where those multiple neighboring local units of government are eligible instead of just the state, right? Which is great. <clears throat> Uh, and so our partners at DuPage County, Cook County, and the city of Chicago, many of whom are in the room here uh, today, uh, are working on a premise for an application for this competition uh, in the near term applying for funding to target three different geographies, one in DuPage, one in Cook, and one in Chicago, uh, for some infrastructure and other measures to address some of those storms that we had in 2013, but also trying to communicate to HUD that they, they consider this moment this competition a catalyst for developing a, uh, what we're currently calling the Northeastern Illinois Resilience Partnership, NERP, not to be confused with NERP-C, which doesn't exist anymore. Okay. So um, what we are here to talk about today, well, this is the first of a series of events that we, the Metropolitan Planning Council, are going to do to bring in national experts on various different uh, themes or trends on resiliency issues. Uh, to share their ideas, share their best practices, uh, help us in our region not only develop this short-term, uh, immediate-term application to this HUD competition, but also help us start thinking through what this longer-term uh, regional resilience uh, partnership and framework would look like. So you're here at the very beginning. Um, what we're going to do today, I'm only going to talk for a few minutes longer. Uh, then David uh, Wagoner from, uh, from New Orleans, will, but has been involved in both uh, uh, post-Katrina, post-Sandy, Rebuild by Design, and now the National Disaster Resilience Competition. He will talk about his perspective and experience on these things. And then Kobe Ru Ruthenberg from uh, MIT, who was one of the six Rebuild by Design winners uh, for the Meadowlands Project, he'll talk. So the two of them are going to talk. We're going to have responses from uh, DuPage County, City of Chicago, Cook County, in that order. Uh, that's distance from here to their headquarters. City of Chicago is on the other side of the building from Cook County, so they're a little further away. Um, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So we should have plenty of time for Q&A. 
The speakers will go a little longer than they normally do at these events, so they're going to go for about 20 minutes each, with plenty of time for Q&A. All right. Um, on your uh, seats, you have two documents. One uh, is the bios of David and Kobe, uh, and the other is a flyer, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end. Uh, those are community meetings taking place in the city of Chicago as part of this competition. Those meetings are already scheduled with dates and everything, so I wanted to get that out. The three geographies, in case you're curious, that are going to get focused on here, in DuPage County, it's the, the eastern uh, branch of the DuPage River, sort of from Lyle to Addison, which got hammered uh, in those two, 2013 floods by, by overbank flooding of the DuPage uh, River. Uh, in the city of Chicago, uh, where the issue is largely uh, basement backups, it's Austin, Humboldt Park, East Garfield Park, West Garfield Park, North Lawndale, South Lawndale. Uh, and then in Cook County, it's in the southern sub suburbs, which in that 2013 had a, had a mix of overbank flooding from the Little Calumet River plus basement backups, plus a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, and so that's Blue Island, Calumet Park, Calumet City, Dalton, Riverdale, Robbins, if I got that right, which I think I did. Uh, so those are the three geographies of concern uh, in the meantime, and then hopefully this larger uh, resilience partnership going forward. So uh, with that... I actually have some questions for you. I have three images right here uh, that I'm, that I'm going to pull up one at a time, and I would like to hear from you what that image uh, tells you about uh, vulnerability, uh, susceptibility to not being particularly resilient, uh, anything like that. So, well, that's me. That's who I am. Sorry. That's not the picture. If you have thoughts on how I make you susceptible to not being resilient, <laughs> we can talk about it later. Ha ha. All right, image one, uh, it is a parking lot. Any thoughts here? What, what does this image tell us about our regional's vulnerability to anything? Just show of hands or just yell stuff out. Yes, in the back. Lots of stormwater runoff. Where's it going? Where's it going? We don't know. Heat island effect, good. Low ecology. Low ecology, yes. Nobody's even parking there. Nobody's even parking there. <laughs> right. The whole thing's probably built for the day after Thanksgiving, and the rest of the year it's probably empty. Yep. Yeah. Anything else? These are all good answers. There's really no wrong answer. John? Minimal design. It just looks like they haven't considered a lot of things. Right. All right. So for a lot of people, that's a parking lot. Uh, for you folks in this room, that's a sign of lack of resilience, which is good, right? It's an indicator of vulnerability. All right. How about that one? That's, that's the O'Brien uh, lock on the south side of the city. Anything there? Regional vulnerability. We're, we're experiencing it right now, I should say. Subject to flooding. Subject to flooding. Well, it's involved in flooding infrastructure. Yep. John? So, I mean, locks, locks are typically where there's a difference in head. Yep. There's a difference in head. So that's a potential um, difficult area. To yep. Lower aquatic go. Okay. Think economic resiliency. Get away from stormwater for a second. Disruption of shipping. Disruption of shipping. So right now the O'Brien Lock is closed uh, for 40 days, right? Uh, and so this is a pathway for the movement of scrap metal, road salt, all sorts of other stuff. It's currently closed, so they have to come through downtown Chicago. Uh, downtown Chicago, the Chicago River is so narrow that they can only move one barge at a time. So we're seeing very significant slowdowns in the movement of goods through the river system simply because... This lock is closed, and unlike a lot of other places, there is no redundant second lock chamber so that you can fix one while the other one's working. So this is, this is an issue where a lack of redundancy causes us economic resilience issues that, again, a lot of folks don't think about. Why is it closed? Uh, for repairs. Yeah. It, and it was scheduled, but still, what's happening is you can only... These guys like to push six barges through the locks at one time, and now they can do one at a time with one boat. They have to take them out into the lake and stage them. It's just slowing things down a lot. The lock had to be fixed, but if we had two, you could fix one, and the other one would still be operational. All right. This is a stand of ash trees, and only ash trees. Disease. Disease. What disease? Susceptibility disease from the emerald ash borer infestation simply by having a monoculture here. Uh, this, is, this is as nice as a place it looks to go have a picnic is a very vulnerable ecological system and that one bug can wipe out the whole thing, right? So when we think about vulnerabilities, whether it be social, ecological, economic, neighborhood, regional, there are a lot of uh, variables and vulnerabilities in place and those are the things 
that this partnership between Cook County, DuPage Co County, and Chicago are grappling with for the longer term. In the immediate term, yeah, it'll be some infrastructure investments that address flooding, but the aspiration here is to develop a much more comprehensive understanding of the vulnerabilities we have as a region and how these major events, whether they're flooding or blizzards or a shutdown in a transportation system, uh, affect us in our ability to execute what we would conceive of as a pretty good day here in the Chicago region, right? So with that, I'm going to bring up two people who know a lot about how those events expose vulnerabilities in their systems uh, and what they're doing to work on them. So with that, I want to introduce David Wagoner, uh, Principal and President of Wagoner and Ball Associates down in New Orleans, uh, and is going to walk us through his experience here. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, 30 or so years ago, I thought to move to Chicago or New Orleans, and I remember the night in New Orleans when I felt like, uh-oh, I'm stuck. Uh, and uh, I didn't actually, uh, it's, this is a mix, because I don't have MIT in my background. It would be Yale, which I'm happy to have. But anyway, uh, you know, where are we? One night on Earth. This is about six slides a minute. So this is basically a, a litmus test for what interests you. Um, we've done this work all over the place. We're doing this work all over the place, uh, including here at the Rockefeller Acad Academies uh, recently, as far away as Jakarta, to begin to think about this. Every place faces a different challenge. The one that uh, we have now in the Northeast, I mean, we're all thinking snow, and we're thinking of this, and we see the white in there, and we think it's, that's a snow drift, but this system in the Northeast Corridor is quite vulnerable and outmoded. I can't believe the transportation structure is as bad as it is. The, um, you know, the SIS, as we got into Rebuild by Design and were assigned Bridgeport and we stepped in, we began to look at these watersheds and this repetitive series of watersheds that come down that coast, very valuable, very beautiful conditions. And then you can say they're typologically similar. So you have this upland condition that's influencing the flooding at the coast and you have the riparian along the river Almost everywhere you can make this diagram, anywhere with a coast you can with the four forces of water. You, the one that's commonly ignored is groundwater, and that would not be uh, sustainable. Uh, but the, these forces of water all have to be factored. The one that brought Rebuild by Design into being, uh, and the one that really hit with New Orleans and Katrina was a coastal storm. And so you can see here how much water comes in. I'm assuming you can begin to read these maps and geographies and so forth. This is Bridgeport, Connecticut, and you see how much of the area is eroded. But you also see, and this is uh, why we're in this strange condition of continuing with uh, Bridgeport working there, but there was no real damage in Bridgeport, Connecticut. You see, though, where the potential for water is in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and it's far, far greater uh, uh, in the future. So as they began to think forward, they realized that, well, it's not really this sound peninsula that we've got, and the edges are really at risk, and the Yale students we have working in, in a studio right now are all thinking they should retreat, because the first instinct is to run from danger or move from danger. But in Bridgeport, 16 square miles, the largest city in Connecticut and the, one of the most expensive places to live in the United States with no services, you really can't afford to back away from the land you have. So you got 16 square miles and you need this land to produce tax revenues if you're a mayor of Bridgeport. You've got this dormant downtown, but nothing is at this point making this downtown work. So the question of resiliency is complex. Bridgeport is complex. And our thesis was connect that center, but also claim this edge. Because if you move away from this edge, you're moving away from the productive cap capacity of the place. So we had these three strategies, fundamentally green edges, trying to soften up the edges and extend them. We did have some strong strengthening of the line, the fortification line, though the height of that is uh, really uh, something to uh, pay attention to and then the economic development of Bridgeport, which has been a case for a long time. The man who's in charge in Bridgeport is head of planning and economic development. Our methodology is pretty much all hands together and let's go see what we can do in three days. And working there in Bridgeport in this rebuild by design process, we were able to put forward these propositions amongst different disciplines with stakeholders involved, focusing on it, the design object. 
Bridgeport, though, starts with an Olmstead Park at the south end, and the work that continues by HUD in the south end that we're doing, it, it base, bases upon this. Now, they get no tax revenue. They get no damage because this park can get wet without damage. So they're actually, in some ways, penalized for having good planning in the current formula. So resilience would not be a stupid government set of policies, and we all know that exists. So this is the South End plan. You can look at the assets there, University of Bridgeport, these housing things, Sikorsky helicopter, uh, power. So we've talked about extending the shoreline. How do you extend the zone uh, uh, to break down? Kate Orff did a good project about oyster uh, be, uh, reefs more specific. But then what would be the South End, and how can this become an economic producer if you're going to invest in this protection around it? Just to the north is Black Rock. So there are four zones, really, in this proposal. This is the second of this. And Black Rock is an eco-industrial zone. The city has this ambition to be, this is Waste Energy uh, Park, they have the ambition to be the greenest city in New England. Well, that means a lot of uh, power generation from incineration, but it also means a bit going back to the processes that got you here. It's a manufacturing center. Sikorsky's there. Fuller's Dymaxian car, which I think is pretty cool, was manufactured there. Um, but then what are you going to do to protect this? Because it's also low-lying. And so you've got to come up with some methodology to protect this. We can do barrier bridges, study, bridge studies, but I'm not a kid at this now, and I know that certain things are beyond the scale of what's going to be invested. So where are they going to get the $800 million for that? So what we're really thinking is a series of smart, elevated streets, infrastructural streets, that really are, allow you to distribute this power generation back into the downtown area and allow a progressive series of adaptations for the industry upward. And so then at that point, you have this neighborhood, this area here that is fundamentally the battery pack for your downtown. So you're connecting one side around to the other and then plugging it in to where you've got to get this engine working because if this engine doesn't work, Bridgeport can't work. It's a strange place, and not to diminish it because it's where we're working, uh, but it has ne really neither bridge nor port. And it's kind of lost its identity, and it's not very popular. You see, welcome to Bridgeport. It's not exactly welcoming. So how do we make something in downtown? Well, one of the, you know, this is the place where the citizens are most interested because they know it's it's, uh, pr it's there, it's pregnant. One of the things missing in Bridgeport is a decent train station. The Dutch took their North Sea oil energy and mutt revenues and in invested it in train stations. We might think about these strategic investments in our communities. Uh, the other thing missing in Bridgeport is this bridge that was blown out in the 90s, and it, it not only killed the downtown, but it also killed the area to the east of it because there's no more connectivity in this area. So these are fundamentals, right? to get a bridge bill to connect the downtown and the area to the east of it, which would allow the commerce to regenerate and develop both sides. Maybe the most challenging but obvious part of the proposal was to bring people back to the water because people turned their back, to, turned their back on the water in Bridgeport a long while back, time, uh, time back. And you see the Pequannock coming down here. And in fact, there's another Olmstead Park. So you've got two Olmstead Parks in Bridgeport. Now that's an asset that most cities would love to have. And so as it comes down, this watershed, you've got this incredible watershed, and I live on the muddy Mississippi, and it's, this is better than the Chicago River for clarity. But it's an industrial waste. They've left this behind, right? We left this behind. And you can see the, the opportunities in it, and I'll show you just a couple of these that we identified. One is to make sure that the water running off into that waterway is cleaned up by a series of green streets in that east side where the connector was, building different kinds of streets. Another was to extend the sort of terraces out into the Pequannock to clean, to clean that water better and to occupy that space. Another is to make an economic uh, uh, driver out of the river, and we found this man who had 140 linear feet and bragged that he made a million six last year off of it, so you see that's fairly productive uh, oyster culture. And so we said, well, you need three feet deep water. We could actually extend that area, and we can really make some nice numbers work out of that. But many times you have to reverse the past, the problems we've made as people by building in floodways. So if the map on the left is what it was, the map in the middle is what it is, and the map on the right is what we would have it be. Because what you've got is this low-end shopping center, Shoppers Plaza, nothing of, uh, that we probably want from there today. 
uh, covering the river, and guess where all the flooding is? Of course, it's here. All the repetitive loss is here. It goes underneath the shopping center, and it isn't hard. This is on Route 1 in our country, the U.S., and here's the opportunity you have to clean that out, really turn landowners into shareholders, and make a new sort of uh, uh, entry point from the north in Bridgeport from the areas above. So it's, an, it's a longer strategy, phase one, phase two, but if you lay out the principles and you can get people to understand the benefits of these and make these things not so interdependent upon one another so that you don't have to do them all in exact sequence, you have a chance to get people moving together. And then, you know, you have to focus upon the ones who have the energy and who have the longer ambition for it. And this was a, a group in Bridgeport that we did a, a river walk with. We also, though, know that it can't all be done out of the um, people in place, and we're working still uh, in Bridgeport now with Yale and Arcadis, and we have a couple of uh, years of design studios about Bridgeport to try to force this forward, make propositions that maybe we professionals can't make because students can maybe jar it a little more. But the, the heart of this uh, work and the place that uh, my heart got taken was New Orleans, you know, which is more difficult. Um, than Bridgeport. Uh, the Delta in, the, in Louisiana is dying. It's, it's a national shame, really, that we've levied this thing. The Corps of Engineers said that we knew when we did this, this 80 years ago plus, that it would f cause all these problems, but somebody in the future would fix it. When is that future, right? So we're losing these football fields. 45 minutes we lose a football field of land in South Louisiana. Our work, though, after Katrina was really facilitated by the Dutch. We had, we had government assistance. It just wasn't from the United States. Uh, and, and our firm and Jim Schwab's here, the APA, Paul Farmer, really helped us. And I have no illusion that this is easy. We have no illusion that the condition in New Orleans is easy. Uh, it's uh, of a magnitude that is worthy of this country, though. Uh, we have to create these multiple lines of defense. So the coastal restoration is essential. The levees are there and have to be supported and paid for and continued. That's the level most people tended to think. In fact, the paradigm put forward in multiple lines of defense by the Coastal Protection Restoration Authority in the master plan, if you see, was the coastal and then the levee and then elevate and pump elevate and evacuate. That's not actually very productive planning, and what are you, if you live inside, going to do about that? You're going to buy a better car? You're going to make sure you got a connection in North Louisiana? There are things you can do, and then the, the third component of water management is urban water management, which is what this focuses upon. What can we do in the place we live to create safety? It does reverse the planning paradigm because ground up no longer means the people. Ground up means the ground. It's fundamentally dealing with the soils and groundwater and biodiverse level. The infrastructure is where we tend to concentrate, but we got to know where that sits and where it aligns with the, with the other layers in that. Uh, this is a beautiful map, and deltaic soils are quite complex. So this is kind of the Bible of the condition. Where can I get water into this soil? Where can I reestablish a stable place? Because if we do nothing but continue to invest in the pumping infrastructure, we project very conservatively $8 billion worth of loss in the next 50 years, and that will be far exceeded if we don't do anything to change this paradigm. We also project $2.2 billion worth of subsidence damage because subsidence is this problem of the weak soils. We don't have actual you know, soil. We have some mix of ground and water, this paste. And if we suck the water out, we sink. Nothing stays together. So we made this case and we looked then at it as a landscape repair project versus an infrastructural investment project because we've made this curious landscape you see at the bottom of the page there where New Orleans is now much below sea level. Well, that's a factor of our pumping system. That's actually our dragging water out of the ground. So we have these landscape types. Each of those have different proposals. And the paradigm, and this was reflected in the uh, Hoboken uh, proposal in RBD, is to slow it, store it, drain it. Only when you have to drain it, because what's the asset? Fresh water. So to convert people, and Kirsten here knows I'm a zealot and people don't want to hear me anymore, but to have to convince people that water is valuable seems pretty late coming, doesn't it? So the other thing, though, 
in my uh, sewing this together or unknitting it in this case is, is really to renovate what you have because the drainage infrastructure you have is an asset and it can be renovated as buildings are assets but can be renovated. So it wasn't to scrap what we have and start over. It was basically to use what we have and shift the paradigm and in this case cut it at the ridge so we no longer pump the water all the way out to the lake. There's a history to that and I could explain. But then we would have a system that would allow stormwater flows to be managed and also not to put the water in the lake, the salty water, before we used it where we could, which were wetlands and so forth adjacent, because even the runoff is valuable to the marsh. We have over 60 square miles of impounded wetlands in New Orleans. They need fresh water. Though we have subsidence, and, if, and subsidence occurs when it's dry. So we also have to anticipate periods of drought climate change probably worsens, and where do we get water, put it into the system at those points so that we can keep the groundwater up so that we don't subside in periods of drought. So the system was conceived in both modes, dry, wet and dry, but it was conceived more holistically as a living system. It was conceived as a blue-green system. It is conceived as a blue-green system with a lot of uh, life alongside it that includes humans asking this fundamental investment question. Where do you want to put your treasure? You want to put it in the ground or do you want to put it someplace we can play alongside and take advantage? Which is going to improve our urban condition? We proved uh, a four to one cost benefit ratio and could have pushed that more if anybody thought it was necessary. If four to one doesn't prove in, in the Netherlands, they would say, okay, when do you do this? <laughs> it's America though, right? And none of those calculations include this really ecological level, which we will have to at some point start to account. They don't include cooling or shade. So we're really not including many, many things that could be included in the calculation. There are all these books. We went crazy. We did it uh, uh, obsessively, and I promise I won't do it this obsessively again. But there are all these different books, and there are more project-related books. We did try to say, what you know? how do you need to see it? Do you need to see it on an urban basis, or can you think about it on an implementation basis, or what level do you think, and try to get this out there in a, in a really democratic way? Eight and a half by 11, you can print it. We work with a lot of people. It's not me alone, obviously. Uh, the Dutch are in orange, as you know, from soccer, and uh, the Americans who don't necessarily like to work together all the time either are, are in blue. But we all had an objective and a goal, and people, when they align their interests, can really get work done. We know now where we live. We actually live in this island condition. I mean, and if you look at the map of New Orleans in 2100, it's really an island on an um umbilical with the seas rising. It's still a very valuable place because your, your port needs to trade down through there, uh, and it's still important to have this delta city. Um, each piece, though, is different. So you have this large area, and you can't treat one part as another. This is St. Bernard Parish, the Lower Nine. It has a different character from what you think of as a city. Uh, it has drainage dishes that can become canals with simple weirs because you need repopulation. And then it has vast quantities of empty land that can go back and become more naturalized and wet. The Lower Nine is what's in this drawing, and you know the Lower Nine has been a cause really for a lot of the nonprofits in America but still suffering and the lower part of it now working with Kirsten and Nora you know we've identified areas that can be made wetter and blur the boundary between the natural city and the wetland and make this a more uh, uh, you know sustainable real estate proposition but in New Orleans it's not limited to the lower ninth ward it's all over this is the upper ninth ward and I dare say none of you have been to the upper ninth ward and don't go at night um, but it's an industrial wasteland. It's a post, uh, you know, it's just a, a really rough place. The original drainage plan said that the water should go out east through that, and then we've shown how it can go out east through their building and public rights of way, okay? If you flip to the other side uh, of the city, and this is where you land at the airports on the bottom left, uh, it's really this Jefferson Parish condition, the suburbia, and then New Orleans is up that, that has different opportunities. And we have a real water storage problem. I could explain that in more length, but it rains too hard, and we don't have any place to put it, and we can't pump it. Well, we need all these places. And if you start to look at your landscape and say, where can I put water, you'll usually find ways to make things better. But somebody's got to write the Department of Transportation requirements to make that part of the work. 
You also have to look at these conditions that are throughout. And if we say, we, we do say we need to raise the groundwater level, then we can demonstrate the advantages very quickly of raising groundwater level in these places and how this will s stabilize the soils. We can also say, well, you know, there really you might want to hire an architect now and then because we don't have to make it this ugly. And if we could easily make it a place that somebody might like to be instead of stay away from. Uh, we can also say, where are our parks, and how do you use the parks, and a small levee around a park, and pumping into the, that out of the drainage will keep the flooding out of the neighborhood, and you'll not have the repetitive loss. There aren't many places with, with empty land, but we looked for empty land, and then we looked for housing diversity, because housing diversity is not a given in suburban parishes. So how do you couple water and housing? We looked then at the downslope of New Orleans. This would be like the Irish Channel and Garden District map. You really want to catch the water as high as you can in the watershed, fundamental principle. Hold the water where it has the greatest potential. It's harder to manage at the bottom. So then we, we proposed a series of streets that are really collector and interceptor streets that can hold the water up the slope. And really, these only cost like 25% more money. And finally, we have the neighbors at least demanding it. But there are lots of micro scale renovations or opportunities here. This is an oak tree pushing out, but if you catch the water in the oak tree and you actually cut the walking distance down, you can really think about water at any scale. And generally, you're going to make a more a habitable environment. No one should underestimate the difficulty of making these shifts, though. This is a drainage canal in New Orleans, Monticello, between or Orleans and Jefferson. I found this, was excited about it because I'm from the woods, and thought, well, this is good. There's still some green there. But then I found the Corps of Engineers' 1990s drawing, which they still intend to build. You know, so we are, you know, the Pogo thing. We've met the enemy, and it's us. It's us. So this is what we have. This is what it looks like as an object. Now, we can more than double the safety factor in this part of town with this intervention. This is railroad property and generally lightly used uh, 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 residential property on the Orleans side. And then when it rains hard, you've got this incredible floodway. Well, Copenhagen flooded in 2011, and they're already building this, right? So they have this park that they're already doing that. I use this as a goad because, come on, it's what, what is America? What is this? And if you don't want it on one side, we can put it on the other. And so, you know, it's really just a chance to leverage. And we should be competing for these assets. And I think New Orleans is competing along these lines in the NDRC. But they're small scale again. In another area of town, we proposed a series of floating streets. This showed up in Long Island, but it was an idea that came out of there. How do you put water along the street so that you can keep the groundwater high? Because you don't want it out of there. How does it then aggregate to create a district? because you've got to get more than a series of wadis or swales. You know, we really want to say, we want to say we're a water city. And the opportunity we have now that the Corps of Engineers has closed or is closing these outfall canals at the lake, those dots at the outside there are the things that enable much of this plan to exist. You get all this protected waterway, but you've got this obstacle now to using it. So this is what we have today because they've left these remnant structures behind. Many of them, you can see this doesn't get closed. You can see it doesn't need to be there anymore. But if you do the math, you find that one of the three, in fact, you can't take the walls down yet because you have to do other things to get the water out of the canal at peak. That, trust me, that's what the one on that side says. But there's a redevelopment mechanism that ties to this, and this ties to NDRC, which is that where's the recovery unmet need? Well, we got an unmet need here. These are still unoccupied houses alongside these places where the canals broke, so we qualify. Uh, and then if you get that, don't you think that this real estate would be more valuable? If you can lay these things open and create these canals where people can actually walk along the water in the evening. We also are working with City Park now, and this is a, a recent development that where we've been able to get them to say, well, we can take and put more water in the park. We've only worked on this for about five, six years to get them amenable to this. But what happens is the red dots, the measles out there, are all repetitive loss properties. And so what we're able to say in this case is we can actually take that water into the park and divert it into the park, and we'll take what would have been a repetitive loss buyout property, and we'll put it into improving the water system of the park. And you can see on the left how much water would come in there in a peak event. But it's safe to flood a park. It's not so good if you're flooding your house or car. Old things are really important. 
So in New Orleans, the first canal, the reason the city's there is a bayou. The first canal was this one that came back to the Basin Street. We know that we can take out a lot of the flooding by using this right away. It's in process, but only a first step. At Christmas, though, this thing happened where they were digging and it filled up and then it went, went around and went viral sort of as a Christmas miracle. Look, Lafitte's actually going to be a blue way. And this was going from Nora and so forth because the ambition once somebody sees this is pretty strong to have it. And we have an endless source then for water and this is actually an essential source because it's a key to the system. So again, we're thinking at system scale, we're thinking at district scale, at place scale, and at project scale all the time. You're trying to work back and forth so it can be more. You're trying to make a place people want to be. You're trying to make a place that creates safety in the environment. You're trying to make a place that recalls history and allows real estate because we need tax revenue in New Orleans, as Bridgeport does, to sustain it. We also need commitment. There's an order of nuns that are headquartered here, the Congregation of St. Joseph. Their property flooded, was struck by fire, and they've dedicated it to this project now. What happens again, to make the point one last time, is by holding water up the watershed, you're able to affect all the areas below it. So if we take the water out relatively high up the slope, we can affect all that other shaded area and, of course, develop a community asset at the same time. The sisters want systemic change. We want systemic change because what we are is not what we can be. We are teaching school. We have a K through four educational program in KIPP schools that we're working on as a firm uh, to teach those kids about water. Every year has a different curriculum. We've done these exhibits in New Orleans. We've done them in Rotterdam. We've done them all over and we've got a lot of people signed up and now pushing the politicians. So it's no longer really coming from, the, never did come from the top. It really was always coming from within. And we have all these people pretty committed. They'll show up and they'll argue for these things and they'll make sure that Article 23, which is the stormwater maintenance, uh, stormwater ordinance gets adopted so that we have to manage water on site. We got a lot of people who want to do it in their backyard and dogs that appreciate it. Uh, and kids that need to know more about it. So that's really it. Thank you for uh, listening. Thank you, David. One of the reasons uh, David is in town, in addition to this introduction, is that the remainder of the week, uh, come on up, Kobe, um, the, uh, the HUD team and Rockefeller and some other folks are here uh, running a uh, resilience academy for the different applicants from around the upper Midwest who are applying for this national disaster resilience uh, competition. Uh, and David's uh, helping out with that, helping run those. And uh, our DuPage, Cook, and Chicago folks that are in the room uh, will be attending that toward the end of this week. Uh, skipping ahead uh, a few years uh, to, to Sandy, uh, the, the rebuild by design uh, competition that you heard David mention uh, certainly came, uh, w w was a thing uh, before Sandy, but after Sandy really took off and there was this uh, massive uh, region-wide, you know, New York and New Jersey uh, competition to develop uh, solutions like Kobe's going to talk about. Uh, for a whole host of communities. David mentioned Bridgeport, he also mentioned Hoboken, uh, and Kobe's here to talk about one of the six winners uh, for the Meadowlands. Uh, Kobe Ruthenberg from, from MIT. Thanks, Kobe. Thank you. Just, you just advance there, and then there's a pointer if you want. Okay. Go forward to go forward. Okay. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so my, uh, my name is Kobe Ruthenberg. I come from the MIT Center for Advanced Urbanism, and we led one of the uh, six winning projects for the Rebuild by Design competition. I'll really present only one project um, in an attempt to present it as a kind of process and perhaps a methodology uh, for a project that goes from regional scale all the way down to kind of a project scale or a pilot project uh, as we kind of call it. Um, and perhaps will serve as a good example for you, for those of you who are engaged with the NDRC uh, competition now that is kind of supposedly somehow based on the RBD experience. Um, so, uh, us at the Center for Advanced Urbanism, we collaborated on this project with a good selection of uh, Dutch uh, landscape and ecology designers and engineers, uh, particularly Zeus and the Urbanisten, and we were consultant, 
consultant by uh, selection of uh, engineering uh, firms from the U.S. and the Netherlands with vast experience in water management issues and protection on the regional scale. Um, the project really kind of was born after Sandy hit the, the Northeast. Um, devastating uh, impact, as you all know. Uh, the second costliest uh, storm in the history of the U.S. Um, emerg emergency uh, declarations made in 13 states, 650,000 homes damaged, uh, destroyed, etc. Uh, we all know that. Uh, Rebuild by Design was uh, an initiative of uh, the federal government led by the Secretary of HUD uh, following this uh, devastating storm. Um, 150 international teams applied for the competition. Ten were chosen to be part of that process, which was launched on August uh, 2013. We're lucky to be one of the ten. Um, and I'll really present uh, the second and third stage of the competition from research to design, um, if there is a distinction at all. And I'll present it a bit in, in a very kind of linear way, even though uh, those of you who have experience with those sort of uh, projects know that it's never linear at all. And we learn as we go between scales. And it's really kind of something that we should keep in mind always when, you see, when we see uh, design of uh, this uh, capacity. The area we looked at was really kind of around the metro core area. So uh, surrounding uh, the island of Manhattan, between New York and New Jersey, we really kind of focused on this frame as uh, the scope of our study. Um, and started by kind of challenging, challenging ourselves with this kind of um, question that we got asked a lot at the beginning, perhaps a wish, wishful thinking question about easy fixes and of course, uh, we know that there are no kind of easy fixes. Uh, we learned from our Dutch colleagues about the kind of their experience from the 50s, uh, building their uh, Delta Works, their famous Delta Works, uh, to then experience and realize that water does not only come from the coast, it comes from the, from, from the land, and, and how that evolved until today uh, from their side. So we started kind of mapping on the regional scale um, the hydrological pattern and how um, the various ways in which water comes and, and affects our, uh, our land. Uh, we categorize them into kind of uh, a few uh, uh, terms. Of course, we know sea level rise is kind of uh, predicted. Storm surge is, is uh, upon us, high rivers, rainfall, etc. And um, we really try to kind of couple uh, specific geographies and topographies in the way they, re they, they respond and uh, interact with a, with a variety of storm uh, um, potentials. Uh, we map that across the region to try to define uh, the characteristics, the, the local characteristics of, of certain areas to kind of break down the overall map into smaller parts and to define each part as kind of a unique, um, unique area that have a, have a set, set of issues that are not only kind of social, uh, political, etc., but really kind of between uh, geology and water, let's say. Uh, we mapped a series of uh, parameters across the flood zone, 2.5 million inhabitants in New York and New Jersey in this area live in the flood zone. 66% of the most vulnerable communities live uh, in proximate uh, uh, conditions to, to the flood zone. 80% of our uh, regional fuel storage is in the flood zone, etc. Networks, we mapped uh, uh, fuel storage, power plants, uh, transportation systems, etc. Um, and we did that all of that in order to kind of collect it into this meta matrix, if you want, we, we call that the hazard, hazard sandwich, uh, which is really kind of um, an example of how you can overlay a set of uh, perhaps unrelated issues in order to kind of extract um, those areas which have the most vulnerability and risk across the region. 
and we defined this critical regional backbone as an example of a place where we thought HUD could invest its uh, money in a very smart way that would affect the region at large. So not only to kind of improve the local conditions of those uh, who live in that backbone, but really kind of in a systematic way, uh, if, if knowing that if uh, this place would, would uh, be more resilient, it could prevent uh, further chain reactions, etc. cetera. Uh, so we recommended those four sites uh, uh, for intervention. And we were giving, given the Meadowlands, the jury chose the Meadowlands as our site for further study for the third phase of the competition. Uh, for those of you who don't or are not familiar with this uh, area, it's two miles uh, west of Manhattan, just a mile north of the, the, the regional ports, the most important ports in the area. Huge, huge uh, site, really, to kind of s to study and to, to propose a, a design even for it. Um, we looked at the, the kind of sad uh, story of vanishing wetlands uh, in the past uh, century, really, through uh, poor uh, land use um, planning uh, practices. Um, to, to, to look at the condition the, the Meadowlands are in, in today, really kind of a collection of landfills, industrial areas, a lot of infrastructure, power plants, etc., in great proximity to residents, but also uh, uh, there are many communities who live in the Meadowlands and in, in harm's way. Um, and again, we kind of use that haz hazard sandwich uh, 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 method to to overlay all of those um, risk, risks and vulnerabilities we could identify in, in the area. Um, but the Meadowlands are not only at great risk, they have also a lot of potential, which is also kind of the bright spot, perhaps, of this uh, uh, project. Um, because of the strategic location of it, because of proximity to Manhattan and the ports, it's crucial for logistics and supply chain it w and, and would continue to be over uh, the future, near future. Uh, it's, it's crucial for uh, our ecological system and to imp uh, for improvements in the ecological system. Um, it has immense potential for more transit-oriented development in the region because of infrastructure which is in place and with a, a lot of uh, obvious potential for more infrastructure to improve that condition. Um, we saw a substantial opportunity from the energy production side, uh, in particular with uh, uh, renewable energy in mind. And perhaps the most kind of uh, interesting and important factor of, that, uh, of those opportunities are the, the kind of governmental uh, system which is in place. Uh, the Meadowlands uh, as a basin is between 14 towns and two counties, but it has um, one uh, New, New Jersey Meadowlands Commission, which is actually a governmental body that has zoning and land use uh, authority over the place, uh, which potentially enables a regional scale uh, project. Um, we assembled uh, the various stakeholders in the area into a series of the uh, charrettes and meetings to hear their ideas and to kind of write down together with them a narrative of the place and kind of describe how did they come to where they are today and why are they experiencing uh, such incredible amounts of risks and vulnerabilities. Um, and we wrote down this kind of simple story of this uh, Meadowlands area, which a century ago was resilient and capable of handling flood. Uh, and once uh, industry and uh, uh, human settlements came into place, it was an introduced with the idea of risk. Um, now, this is where we are now, right? Um, then the, the, some, the proposition is very simple. We can protect uh, what, uh, those who are there already, the, the, the funds which were, were invested already in place. We can protect that uh, with a strategic plan, with a large investment of money. And once this is in place, we can potentially use that, capture that uh, value in order to uh, feed into uh, future economic development and for a better use of the land that is now protected, right? So this is kind of a 
perhaps dumbed down kind of version of, the, of what happened and where we can go from here. But that was very useful as a narrative to um, negotiate between the various sides that are in place in the area, the environmentalists and the business community, which have different stakes in the area, have different opinions of the area. Uh, we use that narrative as kind of a, a baseline that everybody could discuss. Um, the conclusion was really about kind of land use planning trends. Our project offers more of everything almost, <laughs> and that was kind of the win-win the uh, uh, kind of uh, equation that we were trying to get everybody to agree on. So we're hoping, we're kind of aiming for more wetland and more development, especially from the industrial and residential market. We're seeing kind of no future for the office market, but essentially we're trying to kind of uh, um, propose a vision which is optimistic for the very kind of the, the variety of our stakeholders. Uh, we got a selection of, uh, of uh, letters of support, and and we thought it's kind of a productive met method uh, to engage the the stakeholders as kind of an idea of getting a coalition on board. Um, so now, just to kind of illustrate a bit about the plan itself. Um, Having the concept, kind of a strong concept with a coalition, etc., was really important. But then the the, the 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 actual design of the of the of the plan was uh, was the task at hand. The basin is really, um, as you can see uh, from this drawing here, the there is hardly a difference between the hundred year storm line and the five hundred year storm line. Just to just to show how flat it is and how well bounded it is by the boundaries of the topography. Uh, we did a kind of thorough survey of what is in place, what is at risk, what would be the kind of financial uh, consequences of that. Um, in order to draw a clear line, supposedly clear line between wet and dry. Okay, so this is a series of berms that would wrap around the wet area and would leave the, the inhabited area perfectly dry, right? Um, of course, the berm would look differently every place, etc. I'll, I'll show that in a bit. Um, the wet area would uh, be further restored. Uh, it is quite uh, uh, well kind of treated uh, today, uh, but it will f further be uh, restored. And from the dry side, we'll have a strategy for wet uh, freshwater uh, systems and uh, freshwater basins to uh, capture rain. Um, this would all add up to kind of a comprehensive uh, protection plan, uh, which would then become Meadow Park. And Meadow Park is seen as kind of the first regional uh, park system in the metro area, um, which is well connected to both sides, to New York and New Jersey. Um, it's really kind of a nature preserve. It has no uh, uh, human use in, in a proper way. It's, it's a recreational environmental uh, endeavor. Then this leaves a very big question about the built side, right, the dry side. Um, we were faced by this challenge of making this environment and those uh, type of buildings an attractive uh, environment for future investment. Um, we uh, we had this we used this idea of a meadow band, which is really a consolidation along the edge, uh, thinking of future economic development and uh, in a, in a mixed use manner, not only in an industrial uh, kind of logistics way, uh, around the park, capturing the value the park can offer. This would be included, this would uh, be married with a BRT system um, in a very simple process of first protecting, redeveloping along the edge, and then consolidating in a mixed-use manner. This is, of course, of course, not that simple, and in fact, we are really trying to push hard towards an integrated approach that sees the berm and the infrastructural systems and the new development as kind of one as, as a one as a as a continuous body, uh, which is a, an important element in our minds as designers and planners, 
perhaps a harder concept for uh, politicians and uh, developers, perhaps. So this is kind of the summary image of uh, the regional uh, concept we had, which is first protect, then connect, and then you can grow, right? But in an integrated uh, uh, design approach. Uh, we took that concept and studied various places along the middle band to just kind of uh, con show how it could be adaptable, ad adaptable to different conditions. Um, I'll go quickly across three pilot projects we were kind of recommending. And finally, the pilot project that was in fact uh, funded by uh, the government. So we again map the ones that are at most immediate risk and, uh, but has still a lot of opportunity. Uh, the first one was at the, the peninsula of South Kearney, which is really an industrial area adjacent to the west side of Jersey City. Um, this is how it looks today in a 10 feet flood event, which is actually lower than what they had during Sandy. Um, our proposition was for a flood wall because of the lack of space uh, around the, the peninsula and a central um, kind of uh, berm, even though it does not really perform as a, as a protection berm, it's more kind of an emergency facility, a linear emergency facility, uh, which has a section perhaps similar to this, could look like this. If the industrial areas are then upzoned for multi-story uh, storage, um, taking into account the existing power plant in place. Uh, the town of Secaucus, we identified as the second uh, pilot area, uh, which is really a TOD project around uh, Secaucus Junction, where there is a good infrastructure in place that is really uh, underused. Um, in order to propose more development and a protection system for existing uh, industry and logistics that are uh, crucial in the area. Um, this is how it looks today. This is uh, the route of our uh, proposition. You can see the blue areas in the safe side are really for uh, fresh water management and for capturing the rainwater that would come off the palisades. This is perhaps the typical section of this sort of a plan of an environment that could look something like this and perhaps like this during storm. And finally, this is the project that was selected for, uh, awarded with the, with a the grant, uh, $150 million, uh, which we're hoping for to see some of it uh, around uh, April or May of this year. Um, again, a linear project that goes along the burn, protecting the dry area, typical section, a lot of residential development along this uh, part of the project, potentially could look like this. This is the Lawson Slope part, where, Park, where, do, where you have a uh, forest wetland in place today. Could be uh, restored as a, as a freshwater environment um, and enjoyed as a park. That's it, I'll leave you with that. Thank you. So before we truly open it up uh, for Q&A, oh, Zoe's got a microphone. Um, our applicants from the region, from DuPage, City of Chicago, and Cook County, hopefully by now have formulated a question. Uh, and so uh, Mary Mitros from DuPage County Stormwater uh, is right there. Zoe's got a microphone. Oh. And hello, thank you. All right. Thank you both. <laughs> Good job. Um, I'm wondering, you know, how have you or how do you plan? measure the success of these projects, like what metrics are you using to um, determine if you improve quality of life, if you reduce vulnerabilities in the area? Either one. You mean as a, pred as a prediction of what will happen or just to convince people that it's possible and good? Uh, like 
like after the projects are implemented, or yeah, to commence them before they're implemented as well? So um, there's a lot to say about that, actually. And I mean, as part of the uh, Rebuild by Design competition, uh, we were asked, uh, all teams were asked to uh, produce a cost-benefit analysis uh, study to convince that this is not only a desired kind of uh, vision, but also has uh, financial uh, sense, that makes financial sense. Uh, we tried, I did not present that today because it's, a, it's another presentation really, um, which is something I'll be happy to kind of discuss, but I, I wonder if the NDRC requires that as part of the, the research, research, because the methodology of the cost-benefit analysis is really something that is important to kind of critique, I think. You can convince many people of the reason behind many projects uh, based on numbers. Um, the source of the numbers and what they're backed with is really kind of arguable. Yeah, they do um, hard too, for, you know, Right. Right, so next step. I think it was, th many things were thrown into Rebuild by Design sort of because they were needed. and We were not necessarily the team to do them. In the water plant in New Orleans, we had the team to do it. We had, you know, lots of good engineers who could help us calculate all that. Um, there's so many ways you can get into that measuring and monitoring question. You know, I mean, does it reduce flood risk? Are there more people? Is there, did the market rise? So you, you have to sort of target your questions, I think, of your proposals. So I think if, if we look at Chicago or Cook County, we, we would say, well, what are the intended objectives and how can we measure those? But we also have to look at what the problems are we're trying to address. I mean, it's not very interesting to most people to measure groundwater, but it's very important to us to measure groundwater. And so our just trying to get a monitoring system in place to get data to accumulate in ways we can justify or prove the course instead of it being just a sort of an emotional response to the yeah, there's water in the greenway at Christmas and this must be miraculous and we like it. Those are not insubstantial, but you've got to have something to influence uh, politicians and capital markets as well as citizens. So you have to kind of understand the problem and understand the target, I think. And we could talk more about how you would set that up, but it's, it's, I know it's one of the criteria for this NDRC, measures and monitoring. How are you going to monitor it? Yeah. How are you going to measure it? Great. Next is uh, Karen Weigert, who's sitting directly behind Mary. Karen's from the city of Chicago, mayor's oh. office. Hi, Josh. Thank you. And thank you both for the presentations. Really, they're, they're inspirational. And I'd love to ask a specific topic within it, and that is, how did you work directly with residents and leading to what are the specific kinds of things residents can do, and how do you keep residents involved over the long term? Well, you know, we had less time in Bridgeport to do that. And you're going to have that problem in Chicago in, in this process. So you, ha you have to, we talked about that in terms of grass tops, because, you know, grass roots may be harder to assemble at a certain point than people who are already identified or self-identified as community leaders. The difficulty with that is often, and we have some direct experience, that those community leaders may fight each other for control of the community, and you'll find opposition against one another, not against the, the thing itself. So, so it's really a, a, an art to involve them, but it's very helpful in my experience to get them to think not about each other, but about what we're talking about on the table and what that would do for your community. And, but it takes persistence, and I think it's a, a bit naive in any of these competitions to think you're really going to do community engagement beyond a surficial level because you've got to embed this. You, you saw at the end of the New Orleans thing the all the communities of interest that have risen up to reinforce this. Well, that took time to get those different initiatives underway, get the collaboratives in place, get some funding for the collaboratives so they can stay, and then go into the neighborhood associations and so forth and trying to get them to each understand their opportunities within the uh, case. So I, I think that's part of the resilience question, really, is how we can build long-term uh, capacity and um, almost belief. Because one of the worst things I feel I do is go into communities with some idea about what might happen without any, deliver, without any ability to deliver it. Because, you know, people really 
don't want to hear about your dream for them. They'd like to hear about their, the reality they might have. So it's a subtle thing, and it takes a lot of uh, a, 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 good, a good fortune and also, also a good heart, because if you don't have that, then you really shouldn't be going out there. Yeah, maybe just a thought on that. I mean, from our, our experience in the Meadowlands, at least, it was a very accelerated project, and we did not have a lot of time for community engagement, honestly. And the geography itself is very complicated in that way that it has uh, little uh, kind of, uh, let's say, grassroots uh, leadership. It has, it has uh, a lot uh, of uh, business leadership, it has plenty of kind of institutional uh, uh, stakeholders. So uh, we try to kind of engage both the communities through the mayor's office uh, typically, as well as the kind of uh, large infrastructure uh, utility companies uh, to support the idea of the project, uh, as well as the kind of environmental uh, advocate, advocacy groups that which are in fact in place. Uh, so I'm not that familiar with the NDRC's kind of schedule. I hope you have a bit more time for that. Crazy is the nope. schedule. <laughs> nope. Nope. Trust me. Um, <laughs> so when you have kind of a large project and limited time, uh, that's a tough equation. I was looking for Dominic Tossi from Cook County. Oh, he's right there. I didn't see it, though. You blended it in. So well. All right. Dom from Cook County. Hiding in the front. Uh, Thanks, David and Kobe. Appreciate uh, you coming out and the presentations. Uh, I think the cost-benefit analysis side of things came up a little bit in response to the, the first question on measures. And I wanted to try to come back to that a little bit, although I, I recognize what you said, Kobe. I think it's a, probably a presentation in itself. But I, David, you flashed up a slide kind of quickly that had some of the numbers behind your cost-benefit in some different categories. I'd be interested to hear you talk a bit about that and, and the, the different ways you approach the cost benefit, even if it's at those broad category levels, and then any, any other thoughts you could share, Kobe, in a in a concise enough format. But thanks, guys. Uh, I can smile and say I'm an architect, so nobody believes we know what anything costs, right? Uh, though you develop an instinct for it, and then the market proves you wrong again. So there are really two sides of that: how much is it going to cost to build it? Uh, how much is it going to cost to assemble it? You know, so you really, again, I think you have to look at where you, where the public already has some land ownership, or where the where the processes are that would put this. Because you can um, aspire to own private property, but that's not this is not the Netherlands, and it's not so easy to make it part of your realm. But the benefit side, you know, a lot of it is avoided cost uh, uh, in our model. A lot of it's avoided cost, and then there are these these tax benefits that people don't really want to talk about in many places in America because there no, you can't talk about taxes, right? Increased taxes, that's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing because uh, we can pay to stay. Um, real estate appreciation generally in these ways is a, a big component of it. We still don't factor many of the intangibles. You know, the knowledge sector itself, I mean, the Dutch economy is driven, I don't know if it's 4 or 8% because there are different aspects of that, you know, how you count. But the knowledge itself is valuable. So if you get to where you can export the knowledge, then you have another benefit of the, of the thing. There are a lot of subtleties in this. What we found is this BCA, they don't call it CBA because sports took over, right? Uh, you know, the collective <laughs> bargaining agreement usurped that term. But the benefit cost analysis is, is really an a important aspect. You're going to be needing to look in, in this uh, competition for where you can pull other money in and what are your co, you know, where's the, where's the matching money? Well, HMGBP funds, which are federal funds, are still out there as matching funds. So you're really looking at this portfolio of possibilities and where you can match. I, I think that, um, back to an earlier question though about the community, one of the difficulties in all this work is that the business community typically stays out of the discussion and the business community might benefit by having an investment platform that it wouldn't have otherwise. And it's really hard to capture all the potential benefits. 
in that list we had, though, you know, it was, uh, it was half of it's made up of avoided loss. So, you know, you look at that repetitive loss and so forth, and then where you can, where you can shift that over. And then what are, the, what are the other aspects that are positive? The cost impact is really not that hard to uh, analyze as long, but, but it will be hard in this case because you only have so much time to design. You need at least a conceptual design to know what something would cost. We were asked because we did this Dutch, I'll stop, but we were asked because we did the Dutch Dialogues program often. I remember Senator Vitter came to the second Dutch Dialogue and he was walking out and said, just tell me how much it costs. We've worked for three days. I really don't know what it's gonna cost to change all this. But you need to be able to design long enough and explicitly enough to be able to put quantities to project cost. Meanwhile, you're, you've got to be saying, well, what are going to be the benefits of this? What are going to be the benefits? And then you need to be capturing those all the time. There's really no time to do it twice in this exercise that you're about to go through. So you have to be capturing from day one, from right now, where are my potential benefits? You know, these projects you seem to have identified, where, you know, what are they, what are they likely to cost? How are we going to get far enough to identify them? Okay. Any further reaction to that? Code? Yeah, I have uh, three points to that, pretty concise, I hope. Uh, I think David's point about um, the fact that you need some sort of a project in, as, a, as an idea in order to measure it against something uh, is a really stro a kind of important uh, thing to, to acknowledge because you, you start by, ex by uh, examining a set of scenarios. So they could be also climate change scenarios, they could be uh, economic kind of patterns uh, in, a, in a projection of uh, 50 years, but you need to have a base scenario which is your, pro your project uh, ag to measure against it, uh, which is really kind of a tough thing to have because you, you very fast start arguing for your base scenario. And it's important to leave, your, to, to leave it open enough to kind of discover new opportunities for the project and not to be in a defensive mode to really kind of argue for what you had in mind from the beginning. So that's a challenge, uh, I would say, a big challenge in the cost-benefit analysis. The second issue is the scale of study. Some projects will have a really macro effect on the region. Some would have a very kind of micro effect on the region. It's really hard to measure that effect. So I would say that the, uh, deciding about the scale of the analysis for the cost benefit is really important. You want to measure something that is not unimaginable. You cannot, we, we never measured the whole project as one unit for the cost benefit analysis. We uh, divided it into smaller projects first and then we projected them bigger because arguing for this and saying, of course, yeah, Manhattan would enjoy that too. So who benefit? Everybody benefits, of course. So that's, that's kind of an unrealistic uh, unit of measurement. The last thing I w uh, would say to that question is the issue of the multiplier effect. You can offer uh, more benefit if you combine a set of, uh, a set of uh, effects, right? So you, you improve protection and you develop more and you then have a park and that has more benefit, but so the multiplier effect is an important thing to propose, which then kind of raises your number, your numbers very fast. So I would say it's an important com concept that is hard to to kind of scientific to, to, to make it scientific, really. Um, so I, I would say those are kind of three very important challenges the cost-benefit analysis process. Perfect. I think Michelle from AECOM is going to say something and ask a question. Before that, since we've talked about the timeline for this, just so you know that I'm not crazy when I say it's crazy, uh, the preliminary application phase one is uh, due March 16th, which is a month and a half away. Uh, and then the final application with infrastructure designs and like what it is that we want the money for is due in October. So. Uh, this is not too, too far away, particularly that March deadline for the, for the initial phase. Uh, so it's going to move very quickly, and there will be lots of opportunities and need for people to uh, help. So. Hi, I'm Michelle Inouye. Oh, thanks. 
Michelle Inoue from AECOM. Thank you very much for uh, having us be able to sponsor such a critical, thank you. <laughs> such a critical uh, topic, and thank you to our speakers. Um, I guess just following up on some of the things that have already been discussed here through even the questions is how nimble the process needs to be. So with sort of these pilot projects coming online, obviously, David, the things that you've been already doing in New Orleans, how do you, one, start off with keeping our process, our planning process now to package such a uh, proposal nimble, but then also keep it nimble through process and product um, with changing technology, data, metrics, et cetera. Um, I think, of course, the, the, the application process is very fast, and you need to produce a lot of material and convince on, on various levels that uh, you, you're, uh, you're a good fit uh, to be selected, right? But you're really setting up a project with, which is a long-term project. It's a 10-year, 20-year project at best if, if you're uh, considering kind of a regional scale or large scale. So um, it's a tricky thing not to be too fast about deciding uh, to kind of raising c conclusions uh, too early uh, but but leaving your your framework the project's framework uh, flexible enough for the future um, and of course we, we learn more we know more technology improves we get better data over time etc so I would just emphasize again the, the kind of the issue of scenario planning and you can be very convincing about uh, knowing a lot about the various potentials and challenges that the area faces and exposing that, and not really, um, uh, and not preferring a certain scenario uh, too much from the very beginning. That, that's what I would say to that. I think as the week goes on, this group, not to be too assertive here, but may be challenged with the proposition that you have three projects. I think that you're going to find people saying, I don't want your projects, I want your program. I want your approach. I want what you're trying to accomplish on the whole. I don't want to know what you're going to do in the specific yet, because you shouldn't know. You should know what you're trying to do in an overarching way. And I think that um, you can move that by talking about uh, geographies, as you already said, or prototypes, or ecotypes, or whatever those are. Uh, and most of the jurisdictions I've seen have had something in mind. But then what's the community process? Right? I mean, are we only going to talk about what the thing that's designed in their community is versus uh, maybe in New Orleans the case becomes, you know, we have all these projects identified. We've worked on this a long time. Now it becomes like where's the, where are the players who want to do more? So where are the ones that actually have more community support or more private industry support or more assets that can be pulled into it? And then how do those projects actually rise because there's a program involved? As you begin to design something, you know, you don't want it ever to be a closed system. I mean, the Dutch built those closed structures and had to go back and reopen them after the, the Delta Works, you know, during the 60s, 70s, they were closing off and, and, you know, ruining the ecosystems behind, and they come back to reopen them. So reversible measures are uh, usually preferred. Um, things that are more independent, you know, the interdependent measures are not very helpful, even though some things in systems analysis have to happen. But I think that the challenge that I hear, uh, Josh and others, is going to be this idea that we have our three projects. Well, maybe Chicago has, can contribute more than three projects. Maybe it's a complete you know, approach that you can create and, and put forward. Those projects are examples of. So I think you have to be careful. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a curse, you know, this thing. I mean, you understand there's no real money involved in this, right? I don't, I don't want to sound too arrogant. But what does it cost to build a football stadium? A billion dollars, maybe. And we're talking about a billion dollars. We're really talking about eight hundred and twenty million dollars, right? Available to the United States because New York, New Jersey, already took back one hundred and eighty because they couldn't really let it go out, right? So they, Schumer and, and Menendez and those guys already got that money back. So it's. But this is meant to see thought and activity and action and get people moving in a different direction from the gray infrastructure world that you know, has been the paradigm. I mean, you know, you, with AACOM, you know, most people aren't coming to you to build a beautiful green thing. They're coming to build a hard structure. 
So, you know, it's the, those numbers and those progressive adaptations and then setting in process that system of measuring and then accounting and building the communal will for this thing where it becomes the new way to do it. That's the ambition of the thing. That's right. why they're going to want you to keep it open. <clears throat> All right, we have time for a couple questions uh, from the audience. If anybody has one, John over here first, and then John on the far side. And uh, just do a favor and introduce yourself. To I'm, the room. I'm Steve Haggerty with Haggerty Consulting. Um, you just mentioned, you know, eight hundred sixty million dollars, whatever, very limited amount of money for the uh, projects that there would be. For the for the Chicago in this area, what do you think it is that made it effective for you guys to win the rebuild design? Because there was a lot of competition. Um, what differentiated the winners from those that didn't win? I mean, I, I think that uh, I would say that the MIT group did an incredibly good job of this analysis phase beautiful, clear, really put forward a whole regional analysis. Uh, you know, we came sort of late to the process and tried to get to make some sort of more uh, what, what's wrong with Bridgeport. I mean, halfway into the last phase, we're saying, what, what gives? Why is Bridgeport, this well-located city, struggling? So, so I, I think that it's really a, a question of winners and losers. It's also a question of, uh, of I'm going to be honest here because it's my nature. It's a question of politics a bit. You know, it, this does not happen in rooms like this. I mean, the decisions are made at higher levels. It's not all about design. It's about who has a compelling story. So, you know, if, if Chicago can make a compelling story, and I think that would have to be a story of leadership, it can't really be a story of receivership, right? If you're just going to get money, you're going to have to lead this question. Um, I think then that would be a, a way forward in this case. Um, yeah, I, I would um, refer back to one of, uh, or to a slide I showed in, in various scales, which is kind of a, a map that we produced which marries uh, risk, vulnerability, and opportunity. And risk and vulnerability you can, you can measure perhaps in different ways. And you can convince people that certain places need urgent care or need kind of uh, uh, the money first. Opportunity is much harder to map uh, at times, and it has a lot to do with uh, political opportunity as well. So right. um, I would certainly advise to kind of uh, try to marry uh, risk and opportunity as much as you can and be very thoughtful of uh, political opportunity. If you look at the, if you look at the six... Uh, winning proposals for uh, RBD, um, even though it was a competition aiming to kind of uh, create innovative uh, projects and regional scale, etc., most of them were really kind of in the site selection were pretty common sense actually, which they did not require that whole process of a regional study, etc. Uh, so the opportunity was perhaps there from the beginning and. The process was kind of a, a, a showcase of how this is necessary there, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Great. Time for one more question. John, over here, it's always dangerous to give him the last word. But. John Watson, uh, who along with Catherine O'Connor is here from the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, mm -hmm. another important partner, uh, particularly for Chicago and Cook County as we tackle rain in particular. Yes, yeah. Thank you. We're the Regional uh, Stormwater Authority. Um, so. More from a from a design uh, conceptual design perspective, I guess. Um, I, I very interesting presentation, both of you. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Wagner. You had discussed uh, putting water on in city parks, um, and, and also the, the canals. Um, you know things like that. How you know how does water stay in a park if it's all at grade? Um, is, is there a levee along the side? And and if you're going to put it in these canals, how if you're going to impound them with um, with uh, those dams, I guess, weirs that you were talking about, um, how do you still retain the same amount of, or an adequate amount of storage and uh, flow rate capacity through there? Uh, I can kind of connect. a softball to finish with, John. Thank you very much. <laughs> I can kind of connect those two questions anyway, John. Uh, City Park is a key entity. New Orleans is flat, right, where it's harder to operate. But water does flow. And what we have is the ability to create head through the bayou that then flows into the park 
and it's through a system of very simple weirs allows it to aggregate and, and it's going to go in some, right? And then at the outflow, you always have to have an outfall condition or outflow condition. Um, there are still levees in the landscape. This is not a flat landscape. In fact, the, the, uh, we never have argued to take down, I'm unclear about many things, but take down the levees on top of the outfall canals on the side of those. Actually, it's the walls that preclude you from walking on the levee that we're talking about. You have to understand the landscape as a structure as well as a water body. So we have in mind that there's a, there's a ridge through New Orleans, just to be overt, that's about four feet above sea level. It's an old distributary. And these outfall canal walls, excuse me, levees, would need you about plus four or five. So your landscape has a structure in it. And then the water is set at a certain level. To be conscious of the water level and to operate that water level then requires a shift in the management regime of all this. So this all takes time because only now, by making City Park part of this discussion, does the water board say, then therefore we need to manage the bayou, then therefore we need to manage all the water levels within the city. Because no one was consciously managing the water levels, and you've got to consciously manage your water levels in all these bodies. Uh, and then you've got to manage the groundwater levels, right? But that's why it's a good uh, role for the future. I was on a tour <clears throat> with one of David's colleagues looking at some of the stuff in September and water, groundwater management as well as above water management uh, until Katrina was described to me as being a very polite system of anarchy, which I think is probably still the case. All right, before uh, we move on, <clears throat> I just wanted to point out uh, you all have this flyer. So the city of Chicago for this resilience competition has its uh, community meetings planned. If you are interested in attending, if you are interested in volunteering and helping run out a uh, table or something like that, if you know people in these neighborhoods, if you have a Twitter account, you should talk to that man in the back, Hubert, not Gene. Gene's a good guy too. Hubert Morgan in the back, uh, who is uh, the point person for all of this community assistance. He would appreciate your help. Uh, DuPage County has already had a couple of meetings. I think there are a couple more coming. Sarah and, and Mary are back here. And February 5th in Wheaton. I would encourage you to talk to Sarah and Mary. And Cook County is in the process of planning its meetings uh, right now. Um, with that, I want to thank uh, AECOM, our sponsor, uh, but also Kobe and David, and then everyone in the room, and it's about half the room, uh, who is working on our region's application uh, for this competition, um, many of whom are staying for another meeting in here from 2 to 4 o'clock. So please, as you get up, take your garbage. There are trash cans outside every door. Uh, stay, chat, mingle, and everything. Just recognize that we need to flip the room for a second meeting at 2 o'clock. So thank you all very much. See you again.